right, everybody, we are live. This is a podcast. And today we're going to really take off and dive a little deeper on some of our conversations that we've started surrounding the session at the National Conference called A History of the Vineyard Through Song. And today, my special guest is Ed Pjork. Ed, thanks for coming to the pod. Oh, it's so good to be here and represent the Wild West. Man, that is so good to have some Westerners out here. Uh, you were talking just a moment ago off mic about how much you love humidity. Oh, <clears throat> yes. We come out here often just to experience it <laughs> because we don't have it uh, in Southern California. That's right. I hope you're picking up the mm -hmm. sarcasm mm -hmm. in his voice. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, let me just frame this conversation this way. Nicole's here with me. Nicole, you feel free to jump in anytime you I want. Well, So we had this session at the National Conference that happens on Wednesday night. It's called A History of the Vineyard Through Song. And in it, we at least attempt, and I think we do a decent job of attempting that, of telling our vineyard story and using the songs of the vineyard to sort of do that. And it's not told chronologically, but instead it's thematically. And one of the themes that pops up during that night is this idea of a merciful father. And we use some audio from you uh, in there, but uh, that's just sort of like maybe the frame behind this conversation. But before we get into that, I, I would love it if you would just share a little bit of your own, your own history and your own story for us. Where are you from? How did you grow up? Who were your mom and dad? Was anybody a believer? How did you get saved? Mm -hmm. Whatever feels, feels pertinent there. Well, I am a native Californian, All born, right. born in Los Angeles, and at age seven months, I moved to a little resort village called San Clemente mm -hmm. with less than 3,000 people, and that's where I grew up. And uh, so I grew up near the ocean, and in my growing up, I became a surfer and have surfed my whole life, still do. You look like a surfer. I just want to say that. Yes. Uh, and as far as my family... Uh, my father was a Catholic, but did not attend a, a church. Uh, my mother uh, was a Christian. She would attend church occasionally, and I can remember sitting in a little uh, Episcopalian church, you know, coloring pictures and looking at the Stations of the Cross. And uh, uh, my mom wanted me to be baptized, and I got baptized in a Presbyterian church when I was 12. From that point on, I just entered the Southern California lifestyle, which is, has good things and bad things, and went to school and uh, didn't do too well because I was surfing instead of going to my classes, <laughs> uh, which really upset my father. Mm. And uh, when that happened, when I failed in what he wanted me to be, I experienced his rejection in my life, which I had uh, experienced before. Mm. And when I think about my spiritual journey, uh, that I've always had a struggle with core rejection and that core loneliness and seeking a father's love. So uh, I got married, and when uh, I got married, I began to find myself distraught because I couldn't go surfing as much, <laughs> and I had to get a real job. Mm. But uh, some of my uh, emotional issues that I had growing up, I think, began to surface. And I tried to anesthetize them, you know, through very addictive activities. Uh, but then there was an event when my mother was only 45, died of cancer. Wow. And when that happened, I had an emotional breakdown. And one night in the midst of the, the darkness of that, my wife prayed a little simple prayer that God would help us. And the Spirit of the Lord, as I look back on it, literally blew into our into our room. Mm. And when we woke up in the morning, we felt that we'd met God. Mm. So what do we need to do? And that was go to church. Mm. And we went to a Presbyterian church where I was baptized. And the moment we began to sing a hymn about Jesus, and the preacher read a, a you know, a book of the Bible that talked about Jesus, I wanted to stand up and say, I met Jesus last night. And that's sort of my growing up, and that's when my conversion experience uh, 
happened from that point on is like within within a couple months, the youth minister there, you know, discovered that I was a surfer, motorcycle rider, all of this stuff, and said, "You're the man we want to teach our teenagers about the Lord," of which I knew nothing. <laughs> yeah, you're like, what? What am I going to teach? <laughs> and so I was literally one page ahead of them mm -hmm. on, uh, you know. Reading the Gospel of John, for example, I never read it before. I, I'd read it, and I had a little book that helped me understand it, and I, and I would teach them. And from that point on, I I remained in ministry. Wow. From that point on, kept seeking the Lord and responding to His call, and have been in ministry ever since, which is is mount, mounting to. Uh, almost 60 years. It's amazing. So, like, I was just listening to your story there. So, am I picking up this right? So, you were really close to your mom? Yes. And you were maybe, your relationship with your dad was rocky? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, when your mom died, that was like a big... Emotional breakdown. Yeah. Because she was the source of my, you know, feeling some emotional love. Yeah. And when when she died, it was like the child in me all of a sudden, who was already rejected by my dad, was abandoned mm -hmm. by my mother. And that was part of the emotional darkness that happened, uh, mm -hmm. which precipitated my salvation. Mm -hmm. And then I think that from that point on, too, I began to you know, follow Jesus, serve Jesus, study the Bible, which uh, pretty soon I became a youth pastor, and then I was a senior pastor, very conservative, teaching the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I still had this emptiness. And it drove me to preach the best sermons, you know, to have the biggest church. It really drove me, and but it also, it led to a place where, once again, I sort of broke down because I was so empty, uh, so tired, and I wasn't getting the results I wanted. And I was afraid then that I wouldn't have the biggest church, et cetera. And it was at that, it was at that point, all of this became precipitated, you know, this uh, uh, emptiness, but this desire. And I happened to go to a conference that was talking about evangelism, and there's a man by the name of John Wimber, who I'd never really heard of before, who was doing it. What year would this have been? This would have been in 1981. Okay. And there, I, I was, I was, he was going to, I thought he was going to speak about evangelism, and I'd be able to get evangelism, you know, techniques and build a bigger church, feel, yeah. better, feel mm -hmm. better about myself. And instead, he talked about building the church from the bottom up. And this, this structure of uh, how you would build the church with certain values, and one of them was the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and at that point uh, in 1981, the Vineyard had al already experienced the Lonnie Frisbee Mother's Day event, and yes. now they're all about the inbreaking power of the Spirit. So when he said that, he said, there's one thing that came out in that conference. He says, I will run into young men who are burned out in ministry, and I will lay hands on them, and the power of the Spirit will com come upon them, and it will change their life. And you're that's like, a, that's me. That's me. Yeah. Yes. And I, and I went home and told my wife that, and uh, soon after that, there was a crisis that began to develop in the church because I started seeking the Holy Spirit, and the church really didn't want to. Because wow. you were Presbyterian? Uh, no, it, it was just a Bible church, a yeah. Calvary Chapel-type Bible yeah. church. It okay. came out of the original Jesus Revolution. Yeah like many new Bible churches. And so at that point, as I began to move towards the Spirit, it was like the church leadership, this is a uh, egalitarian, sort of began to close in around me and say, no. Wow. And so when that started to precipitate into something that was uh, about to uh, explode, this pressure came on me, and what happened was they put me on a leave of absence, and which because I thought I was like the sole leader, it was very traumatizing. And in the middle of that, uh, getting in touch with that pregnant moment, my wife said, you need to go uh, get counseling from that John Wembley guy. Yeah. She called him John Wembley? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay so I have another question there, too. So when the church leaders put you on leave of absence, 
did that tap back into all of your abandonment stuff? Again? Ab absolutely. Yeah. I felt rejected. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, by these figures, and I felt ab uh, the abandonment was, you know, abandonment is always a little murkier to get in touch with. But yes, I felt yeah, felt you're those like, oh, things. Oh, here we go again. Yes. Yeah. And so then I, I end up going to visit John Wimber. In the, old, in the old little office that he had up uh, before they ever had a building yeah. in Yorba Linda. And so I was in his office and was uh, telling him my story. And he was listening, and then he basically, the counsel was, you're in a dysfunctional government, and you need to declare who you are. But let me pray for you. So he comes over, you know, around to the desk, and he lays hands on me, and this was totally new to me, and he lays hands on me, and I close my eyes, and I just see this vision of this wind blowing through my soul, almost my mind and soul, and dusting off all of these books, and, and he's prophesying over me mm. that this is the man who you are, because I thought, you know, I really wasn't the, who I needed to be. I, he says, this is who you are, and he started prophesying over me all of these things about, you know, uh, becoming, you know, this dynamic person, etc. But the power of the Spirit came on me, and this mighty, literally mighty rushing wind, and I could see it in my mind, and that completely changed in a moment my paradigm on the whole thing. Mm. All of a sudden... It, I began to see who I really was, and what was happening, I was receiving this affirmation from this father figure, and with that, it just changed the paradigm. And from that, I get just the term DNA. You know, my D spiritual DNA changed in a moment into what I call historic vineyard DNA. Mm. Mm. And what do you mean by historic vineyard DNA? Well, it's it's something that the Spirit infuses, and it it has the mercy of Jesus. Say more about the mercy of Jesus. Well, when you go to these meetings, you know, in Canyon High School, when the Spirit would come, mm -hmm. and of course the, the songs are always very intimate songs addressing Jesus, uh, simple songs that John wrote. And uh, Eddie Espinosa, and there are these simple songs, and it was telling Jesus how much you loved him or something like that. I yeah. can't recite all those lyrics. But when we'd sing those songs, this presence would come, and everyone would start to cry. Yeah. And, of course, then powerful things happened. But I remember John saying again and again that he says, I don't know what this is that's on us, but... I would call it mercy. And I would sit there, he would say that, and I would cry. So that's a, an original part of the DNA, is experiencing the mercy of Jesus, tangible mercy, intimate uh, touch. And of course, then the Spirit would come with power, and we would see demons cast out. You know, and I, that was the dunamis, that was the Acts chapter 2, that was the power of the Spirit. So you have the mercy, merciful presence of Jesus. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. And that changed my life. So for, you know, in the next decade, you know, that drew me into the next stage of ministry, which was, you know, signs and wonders, kingdom works, etc., and going around, you know, with John uh, in doing those works of the kingdom. So See, the mercy of Jesus, maybe even the compassion of Jesus that we experience, fueled a heart that the Spirit longed to empower. Mm. And then once empowered, you had the sense of compassion and mercy that you'd received to give to someone else, and there was power with it. Now, as I proceeded in my journey, uh, well, John would invite me up on stage to pray, because he would say, if I pray and these people are healed, then everybody will know it's the man of God. But if, if I invite someone else who's not me up to pray, just a regular person, we'll see if it works. So in these conferences, he'd always invite me up, and I would be loving it until he had said, Eddie, come on up, and would you pray for this person? And I can remember being brought up to pray for people who are blind. Now, that's, that's, 
if you're insecure <laughs> in performance, that's, that's and you get moment. up in front of a lot of people, that core gets pushed up. Mm -hmm. So the core that got pushed up to me, I knew was the fear of failure in, mm -hmm. in my father's eyes. And, and John would teach about the relationship that Jesus had with his father and that, that famous verse, we can only do what the father's doing, which is a vineyard, you know, banner. Mm -hmm. But you have to read on, you know, there it says, because the father loves the son, he shows him all he's doing. So I realized, oh my goodness, when I'm up there, I need to have the, the father needs to show me what's going on. But I need to experience this as love. And so I realized, oh, I'm being drawn to experience the Father's love. And I would pray a little bit about it. And then it happened. I was at a pastor's conference, and that's where most pastors get their insecurities. You know, they, <laughs> they surface. Yeah. Yep. And, when, and when they surfaced, in, in this particular one, it was my moment. It was the moment when all of a sudden there was a, something that happened in this conference, and I was on the line, and I got paralyzed by fear. And I just sort of looked up and I said, Father, you know, you need to love me. And when I prayed that prayer, this was, it was, this was my pregnant moment and it was providential. And when I did it, all of a sudden, it was like there was, the heavens opened up. And I, I like to think it's like when Jesus was baptized. Mm -hmm. And it's like the heavens opened up and this presence came on me, which I wasn't foreign to. But I felt this light begin to illuminate around me, you know, in my mind's eye. And then the Spirit came and began to rest on me, and I heard this voice. And it's the closest that I've experienced in my Christian life to something that was like semi-audible. And the voice said, Eddie, you are my son, and I love you. Mm and you can never fail in my sight. Hmm. And when I heard those words, we went right to the core of all these issues. Yeah. And it touched me so deeply, and I just began to cry, then weep, then wail out the pain of the rejection, the, the, the loneliness of abandonment. Because I think that's the deepest pain, mm -hmm. is, is, is the loneliness, the deep loneliness that is in the soul without that contact with the eternal love of God. And how old were you when, when this happened? I was uh, 35 years old. Okay, mm -hmm. that's very very interesting. I, I, when I'm listening to you talk, you're really articulate, especially as you seem very self-aware. I, I think that's what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of your own relationship with your father, the way that that maybe set some wounds in you, the way that it made you competitive in ministry and you needed to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. You're you're very self-aware. Were you self-aware as a young man or were you just striving and did the self-awareness come later when the Lord began to deal with you? Okay, uh, first of all, I want to correct my age. It was four, It was in 1985, mm. so I would have been 40 years old mm. when that happened. Uh, now, self-awareness. Yeah, like how self-aware of, of your own pain. Like you, you could feel the pain. You were competitive, but did you know, man, did you know where it was coming from, or did, it, or, or did the Lord have to do a work in you before you could see that? Yes. Uh, I was not aware of emotional pain, mm. but I, all, I did live it out without being aware of what was driving it. Right. But I was uh, so uh, competitive— like I played baseball for years, so competitive. I surfed competitive. And whenever I would lose uh, uh, or even do the slightest thing wrong, miss a wave or something and be embarrassed, I would just feel this uh, mm. sense of rejection mm. and this, this fear that would sort of cause me two things, to strive to do it better, but the other thing was the uh, fear that would say, don't even try it at all. Mm. And so I could see myself pulling back for, from things for a long time. And I think that even when I was uh, first a uh, Christian, you know, as long as I could control my environment, especially if, if you're just like a Bible-only person, <laughs> and you don't let, you don't want to let anything in that's uh, beyond your understanding or control, that's where that 
I, I saw what I was doing when I was younger, doing the same thing again. And so because the, the world of, uh, you know, the charismatic world or the Pentecostal world, those kind of things, uh, I was, if someone spoke in tongues, I was very af- afraid <laughs> of that. Not so much that I thought it was wrong, but, but it went out meant that mm. it threatened my way yeah. of thinking and I needed to do it too. And if I, w- if I, if, if I had to submit that they were ahead of me in spirituality, yeah, that was hard for me to, to mm. handle. Mm. Yeah. I'm curious, as this is happening, how it impacted your church and your ministry, because you're talking about leading a Bible church. Mm-hmm. You go, you meet Wimber, you yeah, have these experiences. The leave of, of absence. Experience. The leave of absence. Let's yeah. not forget that. Yeah. You have this experience. When you go back after the leave of absence, did you go right back and did this start getting infused into your church? And what did that, what did that feel like? What did that look like? Well, when, you know, when I... Um, came into the crisis, you know, the church was in its status, you know, relatively successful church in the area. But once I made my little declaration, well, then I was fired. Oh. And at that point, uh, see, John was watching this. So he immediately was there mm-hmm. fathering me through this thing. And I was good friends with Chuck Smith Jr., Chuck Smith's son, who was a Calvary Chapel pastor, but he was being mentored like several of the Calvary Chapel pastors were at that time by John Wimber. So I went to Chuck's church, and then six weeks later, they sent me out to plant now a Calvary Chapel in the city I used to be in. Uh, I, I'm, I'm re- not recommending that to everybody, <laughs> but but uh, I went back into San Clemente. I uh, uh, started a Calvary Chapel, and the Calvary Chapel was, you know, in itself looser than the Bible church I was in. But I was now under the wings of John Wimber, mm-hmm. and so uh, now I, everything I, we would go up to uh, uh, your Belinda on Sunday nights. You know, and everything that we got, we learned there, we were putting, building into that church in San Clemente. That the worship, uh, you know, I continued to teach the word, but we be, began to pray yeah. for people, you know, behind the curtain. We had a curtain <laughs> uh, from day one. Hmm. And then that was fine. Everyone was going along with that until it came in two, just a year later, is when the vineyard uh, left. Calvary Chapel. And when they left, believe it or not, you know, John told us in Morro Bay in that conference that you have to change your name if you want to be a vineyard. And so I mean, at that point, I had no problem doing that. But when I changed my name, that cost me something Mm. because the people who were into Calvary Chapel left. Yeah. And the people who were just into my Bible teaching left because they now. They thought we were going too far into emotionalism, whatever. and that was something that the whole vineyard dealt with at that time. And so it, it cost me something to buy to get the name to, to stay with it. Yeah. Uh, and then we began to build that in, and that was part of my uh, the way I functioned. Whatever I received, I would come and integrate into my church. And I that term integration was very important. Like when we went through the prophetic years. We were lucky because our church was sort of out of the main flow. And there's Anaheim was the big thing, and, there, and maybe there's a few other larger, but we were a little, you know, uh, church on the side of the river, you know, little eddy here. <laughs> and and I'd be able to pick and choose this stuff and bring it, bring it in, mm. but it was integration. We integrated the best of the prophetic. Yeah. We integrated the best of Toronto. We integrated mm-hmm. the best of uh, these various things. So, but it was all based on vineyard DNA, mercy, power, love of the Father, those three things. And they became this, you know, the, the power thing in the middle. And, and I still believe that that DNA is critical. It's like the, the nuclear fission inside the ma- machine to drive it, mm. to have, you know, meeting the the mercy of Jesus in worship, because that's where we start. Yeah. 
and then allowing the spirit to be the spirit and make room to come out of that presence to heal, to save. And, and then also that there's the introduction of the Father and his love into this. And this center, Trinitarian synergy is like the core and the, D, the DNA. And that's why it's so precious. Yeah, would you, would you say some more just about how you experienced worship? Because this is, this is sort of a recurring theme, just as we've been not only putting this session together, but just talking to some other people. Mm -hmm. There seems to be some sort of a connection between worship in the vineyard and our experience of God's love mm -hmm. and Jesus' mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would you just want to say about that? When I think, when I think of the, the, the evolution, uh, you know, I can't get away from simplicity in breathing room. There was a simplicity in breathing room. What do you mean by breathing room? Breathing room was that it, it, there was space, yeah. a little bit of space. Waiting. In, waiting in between the songs. Yeah. So the, there was a simplicity in the, the wording, mm -hmm. uh, and then there was this almost sense of a breath of the Holy Spirit in between a song, and then this breathing room af afterwards. Uh, then, of course, the the personal addressing to Jesus, and it, and then, as later on, the personal addressing of the Father, and all of this in the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, back then, in those early days, especially when I was beginning to explore the whole thing of the, the Father being involved in this, that there were no songs where we were addressing the Father. And the one who broke the ice in that, Brian Dirksen, mm -hmm. Father, I want you to hold me. Mm -hmm. And I have a whole story about that, but that, that was just like singing intimately to Jesus, then to the Father. And of course, he has gone on to pioneer that. And the same thing with John Barnett, who was our worship leader in those years. Mm. And now you have songs like Good, Good Father, you know, that there, there's... And, and when I'm listening to the radio or in my car, I'm amazed. 50% of the songs that are out from Bethel and all over, they have this thing of the Father, Abba, you know, experiencing that love as part of the composition. So I think that composition, the Trinitarian composition, is important in the mix. So the simplicity, the, how you're addressing that, yeah, but part of what I hear is like it, it feels like you guys were sort of pioneering some of this language in worship. Yes. Once again, Brian Dirksen. Say who, more about say more about Brian. We've got uh, time. Well hmm. <laughs> the story is that I was beginning to teach see, I would always teach on deliverance. That's my whole thing that uh, John would take me along in the beginning. But then when I began to have these experiences in the Father's love and began to, to build a theology and a teaching around it, then I would always, when I, at the conferences, I would do a, a one session on deliverance, and then my other session would be on the Father's love. Would they go hand in glove, actually? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, this thing of getting delivered and then then being able to now receive something into the emptiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's in the in the core thing of I found in all deliverance is that it's all hanging on to deep wound. And the father's love is what heals the deep wound. But anyway, so I was in um, Edmonton for a Signs and Wonders conference and I was doing my teaching on the father's love. And what had happened earlier was there's John McClure, who is a good friend of mine who has passed away, but he gave this wonderful message on repentance. And then when it was done, I felt the, the moment was so pregnant, and then it sort of stalled and then sort of went to a, rud you know, just a rudimentary ministry time, and it was nice, but I said, that moment, you had to capture that moment. So... When I did my session later, um, when it came to the, I got done preaching on the Father's love, and I just I could feel that that spirit coming because 
uh, that spirit of adoption, that spirit of love. I went up to, I invited the worship team up, and then I went up to Andy Park and said, Andy, I just feel like there's this presence of the Father's love. Do you have anything that can embrace it in the worship? And he says, no, but I think that my guitar player does. And so, and I didn't even know who his name, but he goes over to this guitar player and he pulls a, like a napkin out of his pocket and puts it at his feet no way. so he could read it. And it's Brian Dirksen with, Father, I want you to hold me. And during that time, during that ministry, when he sang that song, and it gave people a vehicle by which to embrace it. But it came, and I saw that, and I realized, you know, from that point on, whenever I have a conference, I took John Barnett with me. I took, there's a prophetic guy who could sing prophetic songs, and he wrote some beautiful songs. And from that point on, these were contact points for the Father's love. And uh, in, whenever I go anywhere, and I don't go as many places as I used to, but in the past, I'd have to bring a worship leader. Mm. It's just almost like the Old Testament when mm. the king got, you know, uh, the worship. Put the worship guys out With front. the harp. With yeah. the harp. Yeah. Go, with the, go get a yeah, harp. Yeah, go, go yeah, get, get a harp. Get those guys here. Yeah. Which is, she said, such a powerful, that whole thing of worship being part of the warfare. Yeah. And I'm not just talking about singing triumphant songs. I mean, that they are brought right in, in those ministry times, with the intent to be able to help facilitate the kingdom coming in ministry. Mm. I love that you used to take Barnett with you. What a fun thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, just taking Barnett with you was a... No, it, he's, the, he's the most hysterical, one of the most hysterical he, he, people so, I know. He, he, was, he, was, uh, he was an adventure. Always. <laughs> because the, the mountain man himself. Yeah. I just hear such a partnership in that, though. Like, in the way that John would say, hey, I want you to come up and do this ministry time Correct. now, because I don't want it to be me, just the man of God yeah. up there doing that. Yeah. And then I see you doing that then with John and with the prophetic guy that you would bring who's saying... It would never just be you. It would be you and someone else or you and a number of people. And, and you're not platforming one person there. And I think that that's, that's so often how God wants to work is in partnership and mentorship and in those ways. But that takes sacrifice, particularly if you're someone who's wanted to be the man, you know, or who oh, has yeah, that yeah. competitive thing inside yeah, of you right, right. to give some of that away. Uh Yes, I wish it was, it was that pure in motivation, <laughs> but uh, it was t it was very much functional. I knew how this worked, and in in my heart, my goal was to have this inbreaking, because it wasn't enough to just get the new information. There needed to be a new inbreaking, and the inbreaking would come through the the teaching, the storytelling. But the invitation into the teaching and storytelling through uh, the prophetic song or the worship, mm -hmm. because you sing, Father, I want you to hold me. Well, see, I feel there's three prayers that in the vineyard uh, will be answered if you pray them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Holy Spirit, come. And Abba, Father, find me. Mm -hmm. Those three things are things that uh, I feel are always honored by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so when worship cooperates with those things, you know, you're, you're part of the pattern for, to bring this moment, this, this point of experience. And it can, it can be a very small thing or it can be a big thing. And, and I call it the E-moment. And the E-moment is that emotional moment of the heart. I think Brendan Manning calls, calls, it, calls it the earthquake in the human soul. Hmm. That's what he said Jesus experienced in his baptism. He experienced an earthquake in his human soul. And do you feel like this is your life message? Uh, yes, yes. It's, uh, and I feel like my history with my family and father 
in life was all preparatory for the unfolding of this, which, you know, is probably t- t- everyone is to have some pattern like that, mm-hmm. uh, the unfolding of their life story in a meaningful way, to speak it. And, yeah, I can't help but say, yeah, that's my, yeah. That's my life message. It, yeah, you can kind of feel it just listening to you talk. Yeah. I feel that. I, I wonder if it's okay to ask this. After your mother died and the Lord begins to move in your life, did things ever get better with your dad? Um, yes, they did. Say, say anything you want about that. Well, uh, there's uh, several things. Uh, one is very early on, I used to uh, go to Bill Gothard. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, he's, I don't know he's in the best light today, but back in the 70s, his basic, basic youth conflicts was very popular. And so we went to all that stuff, but they learned, it taught you how to ask forgiveness. And so I, I went and categorically, categorically asked my father for forgiveness on well, all, all of these things where I had uh, really sinned against him and my failures that were often my, really my own fault, believing that that's my part and we'll see what happens with his part. And, and with that, uh, that began to close, close things, and I began to have spiritual experiences with my, my dad because he would come to the Bible church. And, and then there was, uh, when I was in the vineyard, in the vineyard years, we were believed in healing. And my dad had this uh, episode where he almost died, you know, had a uh, uh, serious bleeding situation. I went to pay, pray for him when uh, he was home, come out of the hospital. And when I prayed for him, the bleeding stopped. Wow. And we had this moment, and I sort of said, Dad, you know, I love you. And he sort of said, uh, yes, and I love you too. Hmm. Now, it wasn't totally wholehearted, but it was almost there. Yeah. But things continued to improve. Now he still he still had his idiosyncrasies and those kind of things because he was getting into his eighties when they're undealt with you know the older you get if it's undealt with it just gets worse and so it comes out and so he when you're in pain and he had prostate cancer and uh, which would end up being terminal but I can remember when he was in the hospital in in, in care and. He wanted to get out, and he was irrational. Get me out of here, and and he said to me, uh, "Eddie, get me out of here." And I said, "I can't do it." And you know, I can't. I can't get you out. They won't let you out of here. And he he just had this violent outburst of anger, and he says, "Eddie, if if you can't get me out of here, what good are you?" And when he said that to me. You know, I said, that's it. Mm. I'm not coming back here anymore. Mm. And which is interesting after, you know, all this father. But, and I wasn't going to go back. And then my sister calls me up by the time I drive home and says, Eddie, you need to get back here. Something's happened to your dad. He's changed. God's on him. So I go back, and and, he, and I come up to him, and he says, I want to tell you something. Eddie, you are my son, and I love you, and I'll go anywhere you want me to go. What the, the ne- heck? The next day, and this moment, you know, I cried, he cried. The next day... I, they called me and said, he is, he's going now. And I went there and he was, you know, on those death gasp at the end. And yeah. I said, dad, let's, he was Catholic. I said, Let, let's pray the Our Father together. Yeah. Prayed the Our Father. And then he stopped breathing. Wow. And I laid my, laid my hands on him, you know, and closed his eyes. So he, so he got it right before he died, got something right. 
Well, he said he said the most powerful thing he ever said to me in the last moment, and what it's God amazing. had told me, uh, you know, himself. And so you talk about closure. Yeah. And uh, what a gift. He, yeah, just un, it, it, it's an incredible moment. Mm -hmm. But and so in my whenever I don't teach it on this as much, I just don't teach as much. Uh, I'm just not going as many places. But that's why. I encourage people, you know, to, I mean, receive healing, but seek heal, seek to heal the relationship. You know, sometimes it, you can't do that anymore, but uh, I really believe in the healing power of that. Yeah, that's that's a great story. Uh, um, thank you for telling that. Yeah. That's, I, a, that's an amazing story. I have a follow-up question that, again, we can edit out if you, yeah. if you like you want to edit. But I would love for you to talk about, you know, you wouldn't know this listening to the podcast. We're sitting in the room with your son right now who's traveled with you to Cincinnati to be here. How did that experience and your experience of, of understanding the mercy of the father, how did that impact your fathering? Like actually being a dad? <laughs> it, well, I, what I, what I tell myself and told others is that I, I received the revelation of the father in the nick of time for each one of my boys. Hmm. Because, you know, my oldest son, he probably re received the, you know, the strictest father with no no room for mercy. So there was quite a bit of, you know, giving spanks and, you know, telling this hurts me more than it hurts you. Type thing. And it wasn't, in my life, it wasn't, I don't think we were abusive by under, understanding then. Uh, and then, and then he goes through his teenage years, and <laughs> has all kinds of mischief mm -hmm. and gets in various kinds of problems. But I can remember when I received this, uh, this love was changing me. The mercy in it. That one night he came sneaking home, you know. Because he's, he, I didn't even know he was gone. I mean, he went out, snuck away at night. <laughs> very sneaky. <laughs> yeah, very sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> and he comes in through the window, and I hear him, and I meet him. And I, I just remember I went up to him and threw my arms around him. And I asked him to forgive me for not showing him mercy. And uh, that made all the difference in the world. Hmm. And then with my my middle son, <laughs> they're all stories. Uh, but he naturally, five years later, he he escaped, you know, having little spankings. We were already softening up, and uh, uh, <laughs> and there was uh, a wedding because he was, you know, he was a really active in our church and and very innocent in his. You know, as a teenager, and we uh, had this wedding, and you know, people were, they, him and his friend were uh, giving, uh, pat, you know, filling glasses of champagne. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, I'm telling him, I'm saying, you know, you're not supposed to drink that champagne. I'm the pastor, and I'm, you know, I'm the one who's <laughs> at the you know, conducting the wedding, and. Uh, so, he, you know, they end up drinking, sipping it. He ends up getting drunk. Oh, no. <laughs> I love this already. <laughs> oh. and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, but uh. what, ha what happens is, and I'm not real upset or anything, sure. but, but it's, uh, it's like the people are noticing it, mm. you know, because he's sort of slurring. The guys, are, him and his buddy are laughing. And they, and they don't look at him. But all the people, there's a couple hundred people, they're always looking at me. Mm -hmm. you know, what are you going to do? fishbowl moment. Yeah, what are you going to do, Pastor? And I, and I was, you know, inside I was going, I didn't like that pressure. And I'd say, I ain't doing anything. That's what I was saying inside. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I didn't. I, I didn't want to embarrass him. And I, so then I, he goes to go home and his friend's going to take him. And uh, somehow he didn't make it to the car. And, you know, I didn't know that, but we go uh, to back home, and then I get a phone call from the police. Oh, man. Uh, pastor, uh, we've got your son here. I mean, your son's face down in this lawn somewhere. Oh, no. And do we bring him in or yeah. uh, what? And so in that little part of me says, oh, i got to 
let go get him and let him know that this is now is the time. <laughs> Police are involved now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's now is the time. And uh, but I just remember going there when I looked at him and I had this compassion for him. So I just started to cry and I bit, kneeled over and picked him up. Hmm. You know, put him in the car and brought him home. I never said a word about it. Hmm. And it was like this bridge of compassion was built. Hmm. And then there's David. David, did you want to say anything? Yeah. <laughs> come David's, here and ju- just come here and say. David's reporting. He's coming off mic. Now he's coming on to mic. Yeah, he's coming on mic. Just say, this is very risky. But he's going to just share this, a few. Man, we are podcast freewheeling yeah. now. I love this. We're, we're, this is wild. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm David Peoric. Uh, yes. So I'm the youngest son. And uh, I'm the youngest son by nine years. So There's uh, nine year gap between you and your next brother? Exactly. Yeah. yeah so that's uh, I, I remember that's the my, real stuff right there. my oldest brother telling me, because we, you know, as brothers, we would talk once in a while about our, our, our uh, similar experiences. And... Uh, they would say, well, it was different for you. Because by the time you came around, he got all into the father's love. Uh, because I, I was born in 1980. So a lot of what he's telling you happened when I was a baby. That's right. So number one, I have some of the benefits that the baby gets anyway. That yeah. by the time I was around, they were kind of... My brothers had put them through the ringer enough to where uh, they just let me kind of do whatever I wanted. But I also came into the most probably saturated moments yeah. of of love and mercy so that i didn't i didn't see the the strict uh the, the one one story was that uh was that i did earn a spanking once <laughs> and when i was a little kid and the story was that my dad went to go and then he ran out of the room crying before he could do it mm. uh because he just at that point there wasn't that wasn't left in him so, so something <laughs> something had happened yeah, so I, I, according to my brothers, I, I got off easy. So, you know, I was, I was the one, you know, driving around in the Cadillac, smoking cigarettes with blue hair, and I wasn't getting <laughs> in any trouble. <laughs> oh yeah, well, so I, I got into, I, I found out that any of uh, elements of subculture that my brothers were into, and they had to hide. So my my brother Brandon told me that he had a, he had a album by the band the surf punks yeah. uh and uh he had he had to hide it in the the record collection because if so if is, my, is brandon the oldest he's the oldest yeah okay, and then who's next uh, my brother nathan brandon, brandon and then nathan uh and, and they all subsequently got more leniency yeah and to where i was yeah i was kind of full-blown you know blasting the sex pistols in my room and had you know my my liberty spikes hair and, <laughs> and they just they, they were fine with it there wasn't even <laughs> Things had changed. Them. Yeah, and I'd say, I'm going to go get a tattoo. And they'd say, okay. Uh, <laughs> so this, is, so. this is not exactly like Bible church days, right? No, no. Different, See, we were, d- we different very, days. Very different, yeah. Well, that is so cool. It, this is actually very fun. Because like we've, like, we've talked about it, but then we, we, get, we get confirmation here. Yep. <laughs> Too good. Too good. Well, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, maybe we could just land here. Um, Eddie... Would you would you give us any fatherly word as vineyard pastors and leaders and worship leaders? Is there anything that you haven't said already that you'd want to just say to us? Uh, I just uh, want to say that the DNA of the vineyard is a great treasure. It's the pearl of great price. I'd say keep paying any price for it. It can be costly, but it's but it's worth the price. And uh, for those that are, you know, the elders and the fathers in the movement, to remember that, and that they have that God Himself invested that in them, and it is meant to be given away even when your your hair is gray and you are old to pass it away and the second thing is for those pastors and leaders who are like in the middle age of life that they've got the energy they have the energy to to really invest in the dna uh, to invest in the mercy of jesus and the 
continual embrace of intimacy and the powerful inbreaking of the Holy Spirit. It's the only thing that keeps that alive. And then finally, and that they, you know, who have experienced a measure of the Father's, Father's love realize that uh, they have the energy to perpetuate these things. And then finally, to the next generation, be hungry. Be hungry for more. Uh, let your hunger be known. Uh, run, you know, be, let your hunger take you to the point of risk. That that's what the Spirit of God is doing. That's why you've been brought into this movement called the Vineyard, uh, is to be risk takers and to let your hunger lead you to deeper expo exploration in the things of God. And so there's there's a new generation that's being raised up, and and I believe that the Spirit of God. Is, is moving, preparing that next generation and that God the Father is in it. He wants to reveal his Son in greater mercy. He wants to pour out his Spirit in greater uh, power. And that, because it's happening all over the world, and the vineyard was part of instigating the whole thing. And I don't believe they're meant to be left out in the end. Amen. Amen. It's a great word. Well, thanks for sharing with us today. So good. All right, everybody. Peace. Hey, everyone. Casey Corum here, producer of the podcast. Thanks for listening. As always, if you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. First of all, leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also, connect with us on social media, Instagram at the Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Peace. Peace.